Straight ahead on Eyewitness News at 10, it's back to work at Boise Cascade. That after a pro-union rampage results in more than a million dollars damage. We'll update you on the tension in International Falls. Plus, tonight we begin a series of reports on Minnesota's troubled teenagers. And tonight, a look at those who've been caught by the long arm of the law. Also, take a look at this picture. Mr. Reagan appears to be doing fine after his brain surgery. We'll update you on his condition. And all the Vikings highlights you could ever wish for. Lots of those. Eyewitness News coming up next on Minnesota's News Channel. Federal premium cartridges and 3M's interior window insulator kit. You've got a lot more going for you with Hank Hardware Hank. KSTP, Minnesota's News Channel 5. Now, live, this is Eyewitness News. This is the scene tonight at dusk in International Falls where non-union employees return to work despite yesterday's violence that shocked this little Minnesota town. Many are describing it as an uneasy calm after the storm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm Kirsten Lindquist. And I'm Stan Turner. Police continue to stand guard at this hour outside an abandoned housing area for non-union workers at Boise Cascade. Now, despite yesterday's $1.3 million worth of violence by angry union sympathizers, Police tonight do not anticipate any more clashes. Jeff Crilly has been in International Falls at the Boise Cascade Expansion Project since yesterday. Tonight, he tells us the big question is whether the worst is really over. It's a one-company town, and now is not a good time for either company or town. The company is involved in the worst labor dispute in its history, and the town is being split in two. It's putting families against families. It's putting brothers against brothers. It's not fair. Arlene Stenberg came out to look at the damage at the workman's camp. She's lived here all her life and until now considered herself neutral on the dispute. I'm not saying that the union didn't have a right to do what they were doing, to, to you know, believe that things were going wrong, but they sure didn't have a right to do this. Dale Twite is a non-union pipe fitter for Boise Cascade. He was living in the workman's camp that was destroyed. He says it's a good thing that he and the other non-union workers were evacuated beforehand because, as he put it, it could have become an armed confrontation. I did notice that a lot of the people on the projects were packing firearms, and, uh, and in the event of uh, a life-or-death life situation or a threatening one, uh, that is something that could come up. But just across the street, we found a completely different perspective. Russ Kelly is a card-carrying union member and says while he doesn't support the violence, he can completely sympathize with the emotions that caused it. They figure the union people, this is their last stronghold. If they lose this? Well, we're going to go back in two or three more years when the construction starts. You're going to go back working for three or four dollars an hour again. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. But recently, the only headlines coming out of this town are the ice-cold labor relations. In International Falls, Jeff Crilly, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. And this next story shows you just how tense the situation remains in that part of Minnesota tonight. Today, authorities spotted a busload of men traveling through that area. Police followed the bus, assuming it was headed toward Boise Cascade. But when the bus was stopped, police learned the men were on their way to a fishing expedition in Canada. Thirty people arrested in yesterday's violence remain jailed tonight without bail, a hearing for those arrested scheduled for tomorrow. 
Well, even with the apparent calm at Boise Cascade tonight, the war of words is escalating over the way the war at Boise was handled. 275 Minnesota Guardsmen remained on alert all weekend until late this evening when Governor Perpich sent them home. But was the situation handled properly? Kevin Berger reports the governor has no regrets, but Boise Cascade officials are bitter. Usually they're cops or students or computer operators, but this weekend they were National Guardsmen on alert, prepared to do these very exercises to keep the peace. Paul Olson usually wears the uniform of a Northwest flight attendant. Because I'm a union worker myself, and I know what them people are going through, so. And I just feel that we can solve this without any, tip, any more violence than there has been. It was violence, scenes like this, that led to the guard being activated. And Boise Cascade spokesmen insist the governor should have had guardsmen patrolling International Falls before the trouble started. We knew this kind of thing was coming. We knew it might be very large numbers. We knew that they were intent on, on taking on the temporary housing facility. We knew that they were coming here to do destruction. With all that information, there certainly seemed to be adequate information that this kind of thing could have occurred. But today, Governor Perpich told reporters he can't send in the guard because of what could happen. He said rumors flew the past three weekends that trouble was brewing, but nothing happened. Perpich says he cannot use the guard as if Minnesota was a police state. The only place that there is complete uh, safety is in East Europe because the army is there all the time. They're in every corner. That way you have perfect control, obviously. This is a free society. We do not have state police. BCA Director Mark Shield says agents with video cameras taped the disturbance and will continue to identify those who broke the law. He denies his agents had any intelligence that this riot was in the works. But this notion that we knew or the governor knew for sure it's going to blow up, that is a flat-out lie. Kevin Berger, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. And with those 275 guardsmen on standby all weekend, the state paid out $70,000 in salaries and not one of them stepped foot in International Falls. There is a call tonight in northern Minnesota for peace. That message was evident today on the streets of International Falls. That call was echoed in the pews and from the pulpit today at local church services. So may we now pray after a sad day in International Falls, pray for peace, pray for hope, for reconciliation, for healing of an open wound that we all know has ripped our community apart. We have a news crew in International Falls tonight, and they'll continue to monitor the situation and provide us, you of course, with an update on Eyewitness News Morning. Now, for other news this evening, uh, former President Reagan continues to make an excellent recovery from brain surgery. That news from doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester tonight. This photograph of the former president was released today, along with word that Mr. Reagan spent the day watching football and writing letters. No word on when he's expected to be released. A 52-year-old Wisconsin man has died after eating poisonous mushrooms. Roland Anderson of Grantsburg ate the mushrooms last weekend, and he was one of four people hospitalized after eating toxic mushrooms. The others recovered. Anderson died yesterday at St. Paul Ramsey Medical Center. A grim rescue effort underway right now in Romania, and that story tops our look at world news this evening. A boating mishap on the Danube River has left 151 people missing after a Romanian passenger ship collided with a Bulgarian tugboat. That accident happened about 125 miles north of Bucharest. 18 people have been rescued so far. Tonight, thousands of East German refugees are fleeing to the west. Here's the reaction when the East Germans got the word they would be able to cross the border to freedom. The mass emigration is underway right now after Hungarian officials cleared the route to West Germany. Tonight, Maverick Soviet politician Yeltsin says his country is facing an economic and social decline and can learn from American democracy while changing its political system. We do need a new model of socialism, yes. We have to stop being so dogmatic as we were before. Yeltsin is one of Mikhail Gorbachev's most vocal critics. He's in the United States for a two-week visit right now. Yeltsin is scheduled to be here in the Twin Cities on Wednesday. Well, tonight it begins, our investigation to see if Minnesota's teenagers are making the grade. It's not easy being a teenager, and tonight we'll take a look at what went wrong and why these kids ended up on the wrong side of the law. Plus, a little later on, everyone loves a parade, especially when it's the parade of homes. And in sports, an expanded version of Vikings highlight 
highlights, lots and lots of highlights when Eyewitness News continues. Trouble, don't come around my door. And trouble, don't stop here no more. Trouble, go on and let me be. Trouble, set me free. Trouble, go on and let me be. Trouble, set me Thanks to the United Way, more than half a million people were helped out of trouble last year in the Twin Cities. Please, give what you can. Out of a few essentials? This week at Snyder's, Duracell alkaline batteries in assorted sizes, just $1.79 per package, 25% off our large assortment of Maybelline cosmetics, and your choice of four ounce Baby Ruth or Butterfinger Big Bars, two for a dollar. So next time you run out of something important, run in the Snyder's. It happens so fast, it's almost over before it starts. Dayton's 13 hour sale starts Wednesday ends Wednesday, open till 11 p.m. The maximum security prison in Stillwater remains on lockdown tonight, and guards are preparing to enter the cell blocks tomorrow for a weapons search. A fight between inmates on Friday prompted the lockdown, and visiting hours have been restricted. Prison officials tonight say it's quiet at the facility right now. Do you ever think about how difficult it is to be a teenager these days? Makes you wonder, doesn't it, how we ever got through those younger years ourselves. Uh, Minnesota's <laughs> teens come up against drugs, crime, unemployment, all while they're going through school. One of the best ways that we can help them get over these rough spots that life presents is to take a close look at our kids to see how they are coping. And tonight, we're going to do just that. We're kicking off a special series that will form a sort of report card on Minnesota's teens, covering, among other things, a series of things tonight, Subjects like substance abuse, unemployment, the school dropout rate, and teenage pregnancy. It's called Minnesota Making the Grade. And we begin by looking at the kids who have fallen on the wrong side of the law. We can't show you their faces, but you'll hear their story. This young man is 16. We'll call him Jim. It's not his real name. Jim is strong, he's healthy, has a passion for motorcycles, and he has something else, trouble with the law. A few weeks ago, he led police on a high-speed chase. He was driving a friend's car. There was a warrant out for the friend. During the chase, the car stalled, and Jim took off on foot. The cop, one cop was chasing me, and then there was, I don't know how many, but they had cops all around the block, about for three blocks, because I was up on this roof. And I could see everything was going on. And then they called the fire truck and they caught me. Jim is part of Minnesota's troubling juvenile picture. As the number of young people grows smaller, the number of young people getting into trouble grows larger. And it may surprise you that drugs are not the big reason. The numbers show that juvenile drug arrests have fallen off since 1980, while adult drug busts have soared. If it's not drugs, where then are Minnesota's big juvenile trouble spots? One is larceny, a fancy word for stealing, ripping off property that's not yours. Those numbers were already high at the beginning of the 80s and have stayed there through the decade. Minnesota's other big hot spot of juvenile crime is assault, physically injuring another person, from minor to near fatal injuries. Look at the arrest figures, a significant increase over the past eight years. Experts say juvenile assaults are rising for an obvious and alarming reason, weapons. Five years ago, two kids would go at it and somebody would get a broken nose or a black eye uh, and somebody would lose the fight. Now somebody gets stabbed or somebody gets shot. Uh, and that's different. That didn't used to happen. We didn't used to have armed kids uh, in this community five years ago. With juvenile arrests heading up, it's no surprise that places like this are running at full capacity. This is the Hennepin County Home School for Juvenile Offenders. Many of these kids have committed serious crimes, some more than once. Here, they get counseling, schooling, close supervision. 
The emphasis is on rehabilitation. But experts like Bob Mowat say that that's colliding head on with growing public pressure to lock up young offenders, to punish them as we do adult lawbreakers, and teach them a hard lesson in places like this detention center. For the moment anyway, Jim is being spared the harsh treatment. He'll stay out on probation if he stays out of trouble. Trying to outrun the cops was, in his word, stupid. He says he's learned his lesson. I'm, going, you know, I'm trying to get my life back in order, you know. I'm going back to school on that, going every day, getting up, going the right time. And I'm even trying to get on a football team and all that. But, you know, when you're living like a life like, you know, you're doing all these crimes and stuff, it ain't worth it because, you know, you're going to end up going to the penitentiary. And, you know, you never know. You could get killed in there or get killed out on the street. Just to put all this into perspective, we want to point out here that only a small percentage of Minnesota's adolescents aged 17 and under get into trouble. And among those who do, they learn their lesson oftentimes after one offense. Now, tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, Mark Sapelsa will look at Minnesota's youth unemployment problem. Just how bad is it? And on Thursday, be sure to join us for Minnesota Live Tonight, right after the 10 o'clock news, when we'll be talking about all these issues that affect our kids today. brings you the newest ideas at great savings. People put Martin Senor quality in the most interesting places, and when they do, the results are impressive. Rich colors, easy one-coat coverage, and lasting beauty of Martin Senor interior paint can make your place a show place. Spice up your outdoor decor with elegantly styled outdoor lanterns from International Lighting. These lanterns are superbly crafted with a wide variety of attractive styles and finishes. On sale now at Budget Power, the home improvement expert. For 80 years, the NAACP has been working for improvements in employment, housing, education, and justice. I'm Carl Polad. Support these proud efforts by tuning in to the NAACP Membership Radiothon. Call in your membership pledge on Saturday afternoon, September 23rd, on KSTP AM 1500. Please get involved. Get on the team. Be a winner. Minnesotans tonight are not sure how to dress for work tomorrow. Hi, Dave. How's the weather going to be tomorrow? Do we need to wear sweaters? Just a suit of armor. That's all, huh? <laughs> Big I, I, I don't have to wear a suit of armor after they find out what this weather forecast is going to bring. You know, there's snow. You, have you ever been to Lee Deadwood? Uh, where? where? Lee Deadwood. Lee Deadwood. South Dakota. Rapid yeah. City. Yeah, up near Rapid City. Yep. It's up in the Black Hills. 7,000 feet up. They expect snow to accumulate tonight. They've had snow throughout the oh afternoon. My. That's... Pretty close to here. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Far. That's coat of armor. Do you have one? Yes, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> Might need it tomorrow. We are expecting to see that scattered light rain and very cool weather continue now for the next day and a half. But the problem has been mainly not people complaining about the weather, but about the pollen. Lots of folks have been sniffling this weekend, and that is because of ragweed. And even though the weather has been kind of chilly, uh, well, we're still seeing quite a bit of ragweed in the air. As a matter of fact, it's still going up with our exclusive forecast for tomorrow. If you had discomfort today, you'll probably feel it again tomorrow because it's going to go up a little bit from what it was today. So very high in the high level, I'm sorry to say. Outside officially at the airport, our temperature is sitting at 55. The dew point's 42, 61% for the relative humidity, a north wind at 12, and the barometric pressure rising at 30.15. Today's high made it up not quite to average, 65, 42 this morning's low, very chilly. One of the coolest mornings so far this season and a trace of rainfall, some very light car spotting kind of rain again across southern Minnesota. Just light sprinkles out there, and the KSTV color radar continues to show that activity, but very, very light. It's hard for the radar to see because these rain tops are very low. As the radar shoots its beam out, most of the beam goes above the rain, and it's very, very low to the ground, right out in the western suburbs and across the northern suburbs, north of uh, Taylor's Falls there. And that activity is continuing to slide onto the east-northeast, another little shower just to the west of Menominee. That activity should get a little bit more numerous around the southern part of the state overnight tonight. 
And as far as the temperatures go, because of all the rain and the clouds around, highs are going to be very chilly. 50s across Minnesota, but 40s out there where they may get some snow mixed in. The western part of North Dakota and eastern Montana, that is going to be very cool for this time of the year. And that snow may get very close to Minnesota. As a matter of fact, it could touch into the northwestern corner of the state. Clouds over the entire state of Minnesota. Showers. And they should be a light rain variety here in the Twin Cities area in the southern part of the state. Rainfall amounts probably less than a quarter of an inch, but it's going to be that consistent type, very fallish outside. The forecast for the Twin Cities then overnight tonight. Occasional rain, mostly cloudy skies, 50 to 54. Northeast winds at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. By the time you wake up, starting off the work week, it's going to be a chilly start. 52 degrees with that light rain, a possibility. In the afternoon, still occasional light rain, 56 to 61 for cool highs. Northeast winds at 10 to 15. Monday night. May taper off a little bit, mostly cloudy skies, 43 to 46, and some sun pops through on Tuesday, but it doesn't warm it up much, 57 to 62. The outlook then for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday gets cooler still, down into the 30s by Wednesday morning. No snow in there, but lots of sunshine all the way through Friday, and we do warm up to 70 by Friday. And I have some five weather facts dealing with what you were saying, getting rid of the bees, the mm -hmm. first good freeze, and yeah. also ragweed. Mm -hmm. Well, First average frost here in the Twin Cities, you have to wait a while. October 15th, that's the first average. We could have ours by Wednesday morning, though. Ooh. The average low doesn't dip to 32 degrees until December 1st. And fall normally uh, begins, well, it officially begins. <laughs> The autumnal equinox, September 22nd. Our heaviest snow fell in 8384, 98.4 inches that year. We didn't have our first measurable snow until November 1983. Mm. Tonight, those cloud tops are so low, a guy could reach up and touch them. You, you could, as a matter of fact. Yes, sir. You're tall enough. You know. Frost by Wednesday. Pip August. squeaks like me can't do that. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Pip squeaks. Next up in sports, oh, oh, well, it's one down, just 15 more to go for the Vikings. The Vikes opened the 1989 regular season with a more than impressive win over the Houston Oilers. Joe Schmidt has the sports next. It happens so fast, it's almost over before it starts. Dayton's 13-hour sale starts Wednesday, ends Wednesday, open till 11 p.m. Only one FM plays all oldies all the time. Cool 108. Make the move to your Lincoln Mercury dealer's official factory clearance. With 2.9 annual percentage rate financing or up to $1,500 cash back on Cougar LS or Mercury Tracer. $1,000 cash back on Mercury Sable and Topaz. Or get $1,000 cash back only on Mercury Grand Marquis. The official factory clearance. Make your move today. your Lincoln Mercury dealer. <laughs> that makes me laugh. <laughs> it's a call for victory, and today the Vikings kicked off the 1989 season in a very big way. Didn't you didn't you like that? Well, I recorded that back there laugh. with my trumpet. <laughs> I said, oh, go ahead. <laughs> That's that big horn that they played out at yeah, those Viking I games. They were playing quite a bit today. Yeah, weren't they? The old horn was just a blow, and Houston found out where the real house of pain is. The Vikings, led by their no nickname defense and their no holds barred offense, demolished the Oilers 38 to 7. It was an impressive start, to say the least. The Viking defense shot the moon today. Warren Moon got to know the Viking defensive line very well. They sacked him seven times. Keith Millard led the way with three sacks himself. A very steady performance out of Wade Wilson. And he and Anthony Carter on this 32 yard touchdown pass. That tied the game at seven in the first quarter. Carter caught seven for 123 yards. Wilson hit 16 out of 25 for 218 yards, including this touchdown pass to Steve Jordan. The holdouts look good today. And finally, Rick Fenney scored a pair of short touchdowns. Alfred Anderson also ran one in as the Vikings beat Houston 38 to 7. If they have the house of pain, we have the house of torture. We never let up. <laughs> and Houston was supposed to be a pretty good football team this year. After all the turmoil in the Vikings training camp, the Vikes just wanted to start the season off with a bang. That they did. Mark Curtis has more on today's regular season opener. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. The worst of times for the highly tattered Houston defense, which couldn't do a thing against Anthony Carter, and a fired up Vikings offense, which included, surprise, a running game. And the worst of times for quarterback Warren Moon, who was sacked more times than a truckload of sweet corn on sale five years for a dollar. <laughs> uh, 
Well, you know, we I think we all had good games. We all got a, a piece of him, and uh, but that's what we're paid to do. That's what we're supposed to do. And if harassing him, getting in his face, going to help our defense and our, our team, hell, that's what we're going to do. I think when we banged Moon around a little bit, he was a little gun shy in some situations. But their line kept coming off, and they kept blocking, and they made, they're trying to make it as difficult as they could on us. But we just kept coming in, and it was a lot of fun. It was fun to play out there. I'll tell you who else had a good time. The man who had been mired in controversy all week, Anthony Carter, who on this day put to rest any questions about effort and desire. In fact, on the very first play of the game, they went to him. I think it did a lot for him and a lot for the team, too, to show that if we can get the ball to him early, then he can dominate the way he did today. I don't think I had to prove it to my teammates. They knew all along the type of player that I am. And, and once the game would get the roll, and they know that I... Yeah, I'm going to give them my all, and I don't think they was worried about it. And then there was the running game. What? Running game? Vikings? We had a tough time last year with the running game, and, uh, you know, we we knew that we had to improve that part of the game, and we've worked real hard at it, and it has improved, and, and I think it's going to, you know, improve even more. Line has the potential to do anything we choose to do, and running is something that we like to do. And so the march begins, impressively, for what could be the best, certainly the most talented Vikings team ever. And if you're looking for a catchphrase for this year's team at home, how about this? Field of Screams. I like it. From the Field of Screams, Mark Curtis, Channel 5, Eyewitness News. The Vikings don't have very long to savor this one. Next Sunday, they will be in Chicago to take on the Bears. The Bears were winners today, and we'll take a look at the rest of the winners in football, plus the winner of the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. That coming up in just a minute. Budget Power, the home improvement expert, brings you the newest ideas at great savings. Housekeeping can be less of a chore thanks to a new Tone built-in vacuum cleaning system. No more heavy lifting, and it's easy to install. New Tone's ironing center hides beautifully in the wall until you need it. Has timed outlet, light, and swivel board. Add European timeless elegance and carefree storage space to your kitchen at an affordable price. Avatar's frameless workmanship turns any kitchen space into a superbly crafted kitchen. Budget Power, the home improvement expert. Is a mud clean really worth it? Ooh. Mm. <sighs> <sighs> mud mask or new mud scrub and mask. For a deep clean or a smooth polished clean, nothing feels cleaner than mud. <sighs> my period isn't the problem. It's the period before my period. So I take Prems and PMS to relieve bloating, pain, irritability, moodiness. So I'm my old sweet self again. Prems and PMS for the period before your period. Everywhere in the world, news is happening. Channel 5's Eyewitness News at 10 and ABC News Nightline are there. Everywhere. Ted Koppel. Everywhere. Bringing people together who are worlds apart. Everywhere. Randall Carlyle, Angela Astor. Everywhere. Dave Dahl, Mark Curtis. Everywhere. Weeknights at 10, Channel 5's Eyewitness News, followed by ABC News Nightline. We are there. Everywhere. After today's win, there is only one team the Vikings have to worry about all season long, Green Bay. However, the Packers lost their opener today in Tampa Bay. Lars Tate scored two touchdowns for the Bucks, who put up 20 points in the second quarter against the improved Pack. Green Bay scored a couple of times in the second half. Don Mikowski will hook up with Ed West from 10 yards out here. But they still lost 23-21, Tampa Bay the winner. Next week, the Vikings take on the Bears, and they started off with a come-from-behind win over Cincinnati, the defending AFC champs. The Bengals led 14-7 after Icky Wood scored in this five-yard sweep. Then he was brave enough or stupid enough to do the Icky shuffle in Chicago. But the Bears waltzed off with the win. Mike Tomzak hit James Thornton on this 20-yard touchdown pass as the Bears beat the Bengals 17-14. The other Central Division team, Detroit, it was a loser at home to Phoenix. The Cards win it 16-13. A nice debut for Heisman Trophy winner Barry Sanders. He scored this touchdown and rushed for 71 yards on nine carries. But the Cards won it on this 33-yard field goal by Al Del Greco with 13 seconds left. St. Louis 16, Detroit 13. The best finish of the day took place in Miami. That's where it looked like the Dolphins had an upset win all wrapped up against the Buffalo Bills. 
With time running out, Jim Kelly went back to pass. He decided to tuck it up, run it himself. He scored his first touchdown on the ground in his NFL career as Buffalo beat Miami 27-24 with time winding down. The best debut by a player, Neon Deion Sanders of Atlanta. He took this punt, bounced off a couple of guys, was off 68 yards for the touchdown. On Tuesday, he had a home run for the Yankees. He's the first man to do both in one week, a homer and a touchdown. The Rams did get the last laugh in this game, the last play of the first half. Jim Everett with a Hail Mary pass. Henry Ellard will come up with it in that mess. The Rams over the Falcons 31-21. The worst debut by a coach goes to Jimmy Johnson at Dallas. Jerry Jones gets the worst owner debut, Jimmy too. Johnson. The Saints were all over Troy Aikman and the Cowboys. Derek Shepard takes this punt right smack dab down the middle for a touchdown. Herschel Walker was held to 10 yards, and New Orleans won it 28 to nothing. Elsewhere, San Francisco wins. The defending Super Bowl champs beat Indianapolis by six. Denver over Kansas City. It was the Raiders 40, San Diego 14. New England beat the Jets 27-24. Philadelphia beat Seattle. Steve Largent caught a touchdown pass, but he's out for six weeks with a broken elbow. And it was Cleveland all over Pittsburgh, 51 to nothing. They are playing polkas at 78 RPMs in Germany tonight. The West Germans made it a sweep at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. Steffi Graf won the women's title, and today Boris Becker made it a clean sweep for Deutschland. Becker was up against top seed and three-time champ Yvonne Lettl, and when Boris charged the net, Boris came up with the winners. Mike Wallace was hoping that this match would only last 60 minutes, but it was a miniseries. Three hours, 51 minutes after it started, Becker will come up with the big power ace to win it. The final tally, 7-6, 1-6, 6-3, 7-6. Boris Becker wins his first major other than Wimbledon. He picks up 300 grand for the win. Tom Kelly of the Twins must feel like he's running a daycare center. All of a sudden, he has all these baby face players on his roster. He started four of them against Kansas City today, and it worked. The Twins beat the Royals 8-2. One of the rookies who may play himself into a starting role next season is Chip Hale. This doubled on the right field line in the first, drove in the first run of the game for the Twins. One of the older guys on the team had a big day, too. Randy Bush, three hits, including this homer, his 13th. Brian Harper went four for five. Allen Anderson won his 15th. The Twins over the Royals, 8-2. Toronto held on to the lead in the East after beating Cleveland 5-4 and 10. Texas beat Baltimore 8-1, so the Jays lead by three. Milwaukee over Seattle. It was Detroit beating Chicago by one. The A's over the Yankees. And Boston loses to California in 14. This could be it. This could be the year. It's September. The leaves are ready to fall, and the Cubs are not. They had a chance to lose the lead in the East this weekend, but after taking two out of three from St. Louis, they lead the division by two and a half games. A new hero every day for the Cubs. Today it was Dwight Smith. The rookie cranked out this two-run homer to center to put the Cubs in the lead for good against St. Louis. Five Chicago pitchers struck out 18 St. Louis hitters in this game. Chicago won it 4-1. to one. And I hope Mr. Rag is watching down in Rochester with the good news. San Francisco over Houston 5-3. Montreal loses to Philadelphia 4-2. It was Pittsburgh 4-1 over the Mets. Cincinnati beat the Braves by 1 in Los Angeles all over San Diego. And finally, our Athlete of the Week. In an age where contract holdouts and players whining that they don't make a million dollars a year are quite common, it's good to see some people still play their sport for the fun of it. If you plan to take on Walter Feinberg in a friendly game of table tennis, you better bring your wallet or maybe a new shirt because you may lose both if Walter doesn't spot you a few points. The 75-year-old Pine City man knows how to play the game. So much so, in fact, that recently Walter won a gold medal at the U.S. Senior Olympics in St. Louis, Missouri. And that's an incredible accomplishment when you consider that eight years ago, Walter was critically injured in an automobile accident but since that time, has battled back to be the best in the nation at his age group. I was spent about a month in a wheelchair, learning how to walk. It took me a month, a year and a half to recover from the accident. Then I had the heart surgery five years ago. But uh, I've been feeling fine since then. I just, just decided never give up. Don't ever give up. Staying young at heart and competitive on the table, Walter Feinberg, our Channel 5 Athlete of the Week.
He's going for the Olympic championship in 1991. He qualified uh, for that by winning that. But 75 years old and all that he's been through is kind of the inspiration. You bet. He didn't take up uh, any competitive sports until he was a little bit older, 59. 59. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, there's hope. Oh, thank you. Yes, indeed. I do hope so. Still to come here. The Soviet Union has a new beauty queen tonight, and Kirsten's going to have to pronounce her name. Yeah, she's stepping out in style. It might not be as glamorous as the Miss America pageant, but there's just as much excitement. Details when Eyewitness News comes right back. If you read columnist Jim Klobuchar, hear him talk with a different guest every weekday morning between 9 and 11 on KSTP AM 1500. Listen to America's most popular newscaster, Paul Harvey, weekdays at noon, plus John McDougal and Linda Evans with local news between 12.15 and 1 on KSTP AM 1500. Weekdays between 1 and 3, listen to Rush Limbaugh. Between 3 and 6, it's Bob Yates, KSTP AM 1500 News, Sports and Talk Radio. With every step, your child gets closer and closer to the problem of drug and alcohol abuse. Don't let it happen. Find out about drug abuse, resistance education, or DARE America. It's an in-school program where community police officers teach kids how to say no to drugs the first time and every time. Support DARE America before your child gets too close to the edge. Competing for Miss America, we'll talk with pageant winners and experts about the grooming it takes to win the crown. Watch Twin Cities Live, Monday morning at 9, here on Channel 5. Married with children's mouthy sex bomb, Katie Segal, and a man who came within weeks of his own execution on the next Joan Rivers show. Monday at 10 on Channel 5. Uh, well, I did it basically because it had nothing to do with dentistry. Real people who bear it all on the next throne. Monday at 4 on Channel 5. Another example tonight of the growing influence of the West in the Soviet Union. A new Miss Moscow has been crowned. It happened last night during a televised pageant in Red Square. She's Larisa Letyshevskaya. Wow. And folks watching the pageant found the selection process even more democratic than it is here in the U.S. because they got to vote for their choice by phone. Say that name again, will you, for us? Larisa Letyshevskaya. That's fantastic. I could listen to that all night. <laughs> Well, are I'm we jealous. Gonna, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we leave you tonight, we have a parade we want to show you. Yeah, this is a parade really features Holmes, the nation's largest new home showcase is underway right here in Minnesota. Here's your opportunity to see all the latest fall designs and trends. Over 600 homes will be on display for the next six weeks. David wants to uh, clean up one of his weather facts. Yeah, I had four weather facts tonight. The fifth one was not real. <laughs> <laughs> the average lull doesn't dip to 32 degrees until November 1st. Well. I mistakenly said December 1st, oh. but we all know that it's November 1st. That just, we just gain a month. Can, can we believe anything else you've told us, Dave? Can we? Yes, the forecast. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice week ahead. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Sleep well. See my new glasses? I bought them at Vision World for $179. The lenses are VIP invisible bifocals, and the frame is from Silhouette. Now, these are the identical glasses from Lens Crafters, $49 more. And these, the identical glasses from Pearl, $106 more for the exact same lenses and frame. 